So today we're examining uh, Dante, uh, who's kindly agreed to be the volunteer. We'll be examining Dante's right knee. Uh, the first thing you want to do is get adequate exposure, and for a knee examination, you want exposure of his quads. So Dante, can I just get you to roll your shorts up as much as possible? Roll them, because if you just fold them, they'll probably uh, keep sliding down when you walk. Uh, for you want to be able to see his quads, you want to be able to see his knee, you want to be able to see his uh, foot and ankle, and always ask them to take your, uh, the footwear off, which Dante has already done. The reason for that is you want to also comment to make sure, first of all, that the wear pattern on the soles is normal or not asymmetrical, and they don't have any orthoses um, in, in situ, because that will have an implication on their gait. Um, so on general inspection, start off with the alignment of the leg. As you know, alignment could be valgus varus or neutral or physiological. Don't think too much about it. If it looks varus, call it varus. If it looks valgus, call it valgus. If it looks normal, call it physiological. Dante has physiological alignment, perhaps even on inspection, a little valgus. General inspection of the quad muscle bulk is symmetrical. In fact, he's got quite well-developed quads. You can't really comment on the calves from the front. But off note, Dante has well-preserved medial arches of his feet. In fact, if anything, slightly elevated medial arches, which does have implications as well, but for the purposes of the knee examination, we'll leave that part out of the discussion. Stop. Okay, Dante, may I get you to turn around towards your left, please? And stand with your knees straight as you can. So on inspection from the side profile, we can tell that Dante achieves full extension. Once you've demonstrated full extension, you don't need to examine it again or demonstrate it again and again to avoid redundancy. Obviously, if he had a little bit of flexion or he was short of full extension, then you'd check whether you can cor correct it passively later on in the examination. That's pretty much all you can tell. Um, Dante, can I get you to turn towards your left again? On inspection from the back, he has symmetrical hamstring muscle bulk and calf muscle bulk and symmetrical popliteal fossae. So I'm looking at the creases and I'm also looking at the fullness of the popliteal fossa. One side is not fuller or swollen compared to the other side. Things like Baker's cyst or popliteal cyst, a popliteal cyst, etc., are common reasons for that. Also, both from the back and the front, comment on any obvious pathology, including the usual scars, lumps, bumps, erythema, sinuses, etc. Or an easier way of saying it will be cutaneous manifestations of any underlying pathology. Dante, can I get you to turn around towards your left again, please? Again, the left knee also achieves full extension and back again facing me. And on the front, ag again, no cutaneous manifestations of any underlying pathology. Next thing we'd like uh, Dante do will be to demonstrate gait pattern. So Dante, can I get you to walk at normal pace towards me and then turn around and go for a walk forward and turn around. So Dante demonstrates an unremarkable gait pattern. Now, if he's limping, you can say he's limping. And of course, if your examiners pull, up, pull you up on it, you can then elaborate on the limp. Now, of course, the limp can be then categorized into antalgic, short leg, Trendelenburg, uh, or, or whatever you think the reason is. Um, antalgic is a very common one, uh, which is a pain avoidance gait and the the distinguishing feature of the antalgic gait is that the stance face is reduced. Now, gait can also be characterized uh, as uh, swing and stance phase, and the stance phase has three components which are called rockers. And the rockers are heel strike, mid stance, and toe off. So as you can imagine, if someone has pain when they weight bear on their legs, the mid stance will be reduced, so they want to get off it quickly. Um, so if the gait is unremarkable, say it's unremarkable or normal, uh, you can also say all three rockers are present. Um, and if you think there's a limp or you know what it is, just say it. Okay. A common thing people also ask patients to do is to squat. And whilst that's all well and good if they're able to do so without pain, a lot of the people in, in your rooms will have uh, a pain in their knee and squatting is often painful so I try and avoid that unless I really need to. Um, the next thing I would like to do, uh, Dante, can I get you to have a seat on the side of the bed with your legs uh, hanging off? So, in this part of the examination I'm particularly looking at his patellofemoral joint and there's uh, three things I'm looking at. First thing I'm looking at is the position of his patelli and how they track. 
Remember the patella should track centrally, up and down, but sometimes it doesn't, as in it goes from down to up and out a little bit, and that's known as J tracking, or upside down J. The second thing I'm looking at is any patelloformal crepitus. Crepitus could be fine, as in Velcro sensation, usually associated with arthritis or uh, chondromalacia, or it could be coarse clunking, which is often associated with the patella not tracking centrally or maltracking. And the third thing, whilst I have the opportunity, will be to check his quadricep power. So what I would do is I'd put my fingers on either side of his patella and say, Dante, can I get you to straighten your leg and hold it straight? Hold it there, strong, strong, strong. Dante's got quad power of grade five and down. Let's do that again, looking at the patella, up and down. So Dante's patella tracks centrally, there is no crepitus. I'll do the same thing on the other side, Dante up, hold it, strong, 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 and down, patella tracks centrally, there's no crepitus, he has grade five power of his quadriceps. Now, can I just get you to lie down with your head on the pillow and your feet that way? Okay. So whilst he's lying down, the first thing I do is look for an effusion. Effusion is fluid in the knee, that could be just a synovial fluid or blood or any fluid essentially. So the test for a small effusion is a wipe test or a swipe test where you wipe the fluid from the medial gutter, which is here, into the suprapatellar pouch. So the fluid should be here. So what you do is you wipe it out, it should create a dimple, and then you try and push it back. So if he has an effusion, it becomes hollow, and then when you wipe it back, a, a layer of fluid appears or a, a bubble appears over here again. So that's a positive wipe test. So Dante has a negative wipe test, fortunately, although that might change by the end of the examination. Now, if there is a negative wipe test, that could mean either the effusion is too small for it to be wiped or there's no effusion. So a negative wipe test then warrants the next test, which is a patellar tap. So you try and milk the fluid from underneath his super patellar pouch so the fluid is underneath his patella, and you try and tap it. And if it's a positive test, you'll feel a, a tapping sensation, similar to a, a, a table tennis ball bouncing off the table or onto the, on the table. Test. Doing a wipe test, fluid gets wiped out of the medial gutter, fluid ends up here, you try and push the fluid back from here so it reappears over here, being a positive wipe test. Next thing I'll do is check for uh, patella irritability or patella loading. So I grab the patella like that and basically squish it against his femoral trochlea. Now you have to be careful to warn the patient uh, that this may cause them pain. And if they get a positive response, i.e. they have pain, you always must confirm from them whether it's their pain or just painful. Um, so loading the patellofemoral joint causes pain, that might indicate pathology in the patellofemoral joint. Again, chondromalacia, arthritis, etc. The other test you can do is to try and lock the patella like so and ask them to tighten their quads. But again, this is usually very painful in everyone, even if they don't have pathology. So if they get pain, you must always try to confirm whether this is similar to the pain they get or otherwise. The next thing with the patellofemoral joint you want to do is check for translation. So often the patella will translate laterally about a quadrant and a half or two quadrants and medially about a quadrant. But sometimes the lateral structures are too tight, in which case you might not be able to translate medially at all. Or the patella might be everted very tight over here, uh, often in the case of people with patellofemoral pain. Next thing I want to do is check the Q angle. The Q angle is the angle subtended from the patellar tendon, going from the patella to the tubal tuberosity, and the angle of their quadriceps. And if it's lateralized, often because of the tubal tuberosity being lateralized, that can cause an undue force or lateralizing force in the patellar femoral joint, causing increased loading, and that can cause symptoms too. And an easy way to check that is to lift their knee up a little bit so they're in a little bit of flexion. Put your hands on either side of the patellar tendon and then ask your patient to lift your heel off the bed please. That defines the patellar tendon but you can see in Dante's case it's going down fairly straight and we may show you examples of path uh, pathological cue angles later on but his cue angle is okay. Alright, next thing I do is to check his range of motion and flexion. Remember we've already demonstrated that he has full extension whilst he was um, standing. Now if he didn't have full extension at that time, then we'll see if we can passively correct him to full extension or not. But we already know he has full extension so we don't need to labor on it again. Next thing will be to check his flexion. Dante, can I get you to fully flex your leg? And as you can see, Dante is full flexion with his calf touching his thigh. And if there was any doubt whether this is full flexion or not, you'd get him to flex his other side and see how that compares. So in Dante's case, he has full flexion. Then I'll get him to straighten his knee out to about there so he 
He's rested at about 90 de degrees and I'll stabilize his foot usually by sitting on it. We can start palpation from here on. The things to palpate really depends on what diagnosis you have in mind, but the must palpate areas are the joint lines. So if you follow the patella, that's the outline of the patella, patella tendon. Usually you can make out the, the femoral condyles, medial condyle, lateral condyle, and the tibia. So that triangle there is the soft spot, and that's palpable in almost everyone. So that's the joint line, and if you follow it, it defines like a groove that goes all the way around the back and that's the joint line, the medial joint line on this side and the lateral joint line on that side. And if you get lost somewhere, come back to the soft spot and start again. So I'll always test for tenderness along the medial joint line. Uh, for example, uh, tenderness over here could be a result of meniscal pathology. Feel the femoral condyle, the medial condyle, lateral condyle, the actual articulating surface or the weight bearing part of it. Feel the front of the tibia. You can then Elaborate on your palpation depending on what you think the problem might be. Medial femoral epicondyle, lateral epicondyle, fibular head, tibial tuberosity, etc. etc. After finishing palpation, I'm going to move on to stability. Now there are four ligaments in the knee: ACL, PCL, medial collateral ligament, and the postlateral structures, and those are the four things we'll be testing. In this position, the first thing I test for is a tibial femoral step-off. So the tibia is about a centimeter in front of the femur in the flex position and this thing here is known as the step off that should be palpable so your thumb should come down the femoral condyle and rest on the tibia if it's missing i.e. the tibia is sagging back that's probably because the PCL is incompetent so tibia femoral step off is maintained we do what's called a posterior draw to check for PCL sag in Dante's case there's the, a negative posterior draw and the tibia femoral step off is maintained. The next thing I would do is an anterior draw checking for the anterior cruciate ligament um, and its function. In this case the anterior draw is negative as well. The next thing we'll do is a Lockman's test to check for anterior cruciate stability. The easier way to do it is with my leg underneath there, uh, hand to stabilize the thigh, other hand holding the tibia and pull it up for a solid endpoint. Yeah, and relax. Feeling for a solid endpoint. So this is an example of a positive Lockman's. As you can see, I've stabilized the femur. And see, see how the, when I pull the tibia forward, it comes a fair way up, like that. And this is a, an example of a positive uh, anterior draw. Stabilize the foot with, by sitting on it. Step off, posterior draw, and see how the tibia comes forward a fair bit. And then checking for the, the uh, collaterals, I grab the hand like so, bend the knee up a little bit, a little bit of flexion. I'm checking for medial ligament stability by pushing into a little bit of valgus or lateral structure stability by pushing the leg into a bit of varus. You can also check for integrity of the lateral collateral ligament, which is often palpable in well-defined individuals by just letting the knee sag down and holding their foot on a little bit of varus. We'll now move on to special test and everyone's heard of the McMurray's test. McMurray's test is actually a palpable or an audible clunk. So for that to be positive, uh, if in the case of a meniscal tear, it has to be a pretty big tear. So it's very uncommon to, to get a positive McMurray's. However, you can do a modification of the McMurray's where you're loading the medial and lateral compartment at the same time, as well as irritating or provoking any meniscal pathology, which may give you a positive result. The way I do a McMurray style test is I try and grab the heel so I have rotational control like so and then I put my hand above the knee so either my thumb or my fingers are over the joint line and you start in full flexion in and out in and out in and out in and out and you straighten. Now depending on which side you're testing if you're testing to load the lateral side you push the knee away from yourself a little bit so you push and pull the ankle towards you so you're pushing him into valgus in and out in and out from full flexion and straighten out and that may irritate his lateral side or if you're testing the medial side let the knee fall down lift the ankle up in and out in and out in and out and straighten that will load the medial side but by doing this if they get pain it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a meniscal tear but that'll be one of the possibilities 
Even loading the medial compartment in presence of arthritis may cause pain. Finally, after testing those things, you'll test the joint above, which is the hip, with circumduction for any irritability, neurovascular status, dorsalis pedis pulse, posterior tibial pulse, any myotonal dermatomal assessment, push on the brakes really, really hard, S1, pull your big toes up, hold it, strong, 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 L5, hold your ankles up, hold them there, strong, 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 L4, hold your knee straight, hold it there, strong, 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 3, 4, and so on for the hips. You can check sensation as well, same way, can you feel that? Does it feel normal? Does it feel the same as the other side? Can you feel that? All those three questions again. Here, 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 and here.